Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, the link between vulnerability and compromise. Uh, this is myself, Steve Marshall. I'm the group CISO at Bideson. I'm also joined by Adam Palmer, who is the cybersecurity strategist at, at Tenable. Plan today is to, uh, to give you a run through vulnerability management and look at how vulnerability and compromise are linked. It was said by Charles F. Kettering that action without intelligence is a form of insanity, but intelligence without action is the greatest form of stupidity in the world and, and, and never a true statement in relation to, to vulnerability management and, and why these things lead to compromise. You know, all of these things can be prevented early by understanding. And I think that's what we're going to show you today. It's important that you understand vulnerability management and that you understand the, the link to compromise. It's a partnership, just like Bytes and Tenable. Bytes are one of Tenable's platinum partners. We've had decades of partnership and collaboration with Tenable. Tenable are the market leader in vulnerability management. And together, you know, we're going to show you how to, uh, how to break the link between vulnerability and compromise. So a few facts that you might want to think about today. Uh, the state of cybercrime today is more of a, a reflection on the way that we think about things and not what we do. Cybercrime is accelerating really at an uncontrollable pace and one that is unabating. Criminals, i.e. the attackers, are innovating or stealing at an incredible rate and are ahead of us as the defenders, and we're losing the battle. Just look at the number of records that were breached in 2020. It was an estimated 36 billion records. Now, the current world population is only 7.8 billion, which means that everybody on the planet got breached 4.6 times last year. You know, is it me or does anybody else find that an incredible number? Now, I know that not everybody's been breached, you know, 4.6 times. Some people have been breached a lot, some people not at all. But it's just to give you an idea of the scale of what's going on. It's also estimated that 94% that of all compromises come through phishing or other mainstream vulnerabilities that, that are in the technology stacks that we use today. So that's kind of enough from me as an opener. What I'm gonna do is pass you over uh, to Adam now, who's gonna take you through the process of vulnerability and vulnerability management. Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, and welcome everybody. For those of you not familiar with Tenable, we are a 20 year old company regularly recognized as the uh, global leader in risk-based vulnerability management, uh, publicly traded uh, on uh, the New York Stock Exchange with uh, global offices. I'm based in Dublin, Ireland, uh, and I'm gonna be talking to you about the best strategic approach to successful vulnerability management. Uh, McKinsey and company uh, last year did a study and they said that if you take a risk-based approach, which is what Tenable supports, that you can actually improve your security program almost eight times at no added cost. That sounds unbelievable, but the reason is, is because if you're using effective risk-based strategy, you become more efficient. You don't waste time on the wrong places. You focus time and resources where it matters most. So you can focus first on what matters most. So let's talk just in general about the attack surface for a minute. Um, my, in my last job, I was a global director at one of the, the largest banks in Europe. And I, in all honesty, I focused mostly on that bottom layer of traditional IT assets, the servers, the desktops. These are the things that we're all familiar with. But increasingly, the attack surface right involves things like cloud. So a lot of the CISOs, the security leaders that I talk to, they're focused on container and cloud. Uh, and we also see operational technology like industrial controls, not just in heavy manufacturing, but think about all of the smart connected access devices. Think about uh, the HVAC devices that might be connected in your environment. And these are increasingly blind spots uh, for a lot of security leaders. So the problem is, is that legacy vulnerability management prioritization methods are ineffective. And I'll give you an example of that. Often I'll talk to security leaders who will say that they prioritize by using CVSS scores. These are the common vulnerability scoring systems. Uh, but often CVSS scores are risk unaware. They're not based on the context of your environment and the assets. And about 56% of them are rated critical or high. So imagine if you have 100,000 vulnerabilities, 
almost 60,000 of those are going to be critical or high. So that's not effective vulnerability management or prioritization. Uh, you're going to waste the majority of your time chasing after the wrong issues. Uh, the fundamental data problem is that regardless of the size of your team, you will never have enough time or resources to remediate every vulnerability across your attack surface unless you prioritize effectively. And what happens is you end up with low visibility of assets across all of that broad end attack surface, that expanded attack surface. And if you don't, you can only protect what you can see. So if you don't have good visibility of your assets, you get a false sense of security based on incomplete data. You often have easily exploitable vulnerabilities in your environment, and you're spending time and effort on low risk issues. And you really don't communicate that risk effectively uh, to, to your CISO or to your board and, and business leaders because you don't understand or fully see the, the, the attack surface or able to prioritize effectively. So let's talk about how to have an effective risk-based vulnerability management strategy. And at Tenable, our approach is based on two pillars. The first is VPR, vulnerability priority rating. This is looking at the threat recency, the threat intensity, the exploitability, the age, and the threat source. Is this a nation state? Is it a cyber criminal gang? But looking at a deep and gaining a deep understanding of that vulnerability. Uh, so you calculate a score based on machine learning and based on the real threat that's posed by that vulnerability in your environment. So you have a deep understanding of the vulnerability. But you also want to understand context. So let's talk about context for a second and why that's important. If I give you an example and I say or ask you the question, what is the risk of a bald tire? What is the risk of a bald tire? Often, if I ask risk professionals that question, they'll say it's a high risk, but it's a trick question. Because what if I tell you then that the context is that tire is not actually on my automobile, it's in the garden for my children to play on, it's a toy. So the risk is actually very low or none. Uh, so this is an example of showing why uh, context in risk is important. Uh, and that leads to our next slide, please. This leads to the reason Tenable uses the second pillar, which is the ACR, the Asset Criticality Rating. The Asset Criticality Rating is the second critical pillar of successful vulnerability management. This is calculating the criticality of an asset uh, and, and, and looking at the, the uh, and gaining a deep understanding of that asset in your environment. So it's looking at things like the business purpose of the asset, what type of device is it? How, what does it connect to? What other types of assets connect to it? What are the capabilities? Where is it located? Is third party data uh, on that asset? So uh, it's with these two pieces, the ACR and the VPR, that you get both a deep understanding of the vulnerability and a deep understanding of the asset uh, that might be targeted. So with these two factors, the ACR and the VPR uh, together, uh, Tenable says you can focus first on what matters most. So you're prioritizing based on the importance of the asset and the risk posed by vulnerabilities on that asset. And you're leveraging machine learning and threat intelligence to help you prioritize better. And this way you can prioritize assets based on their indicators of business value and criticality. We estimate that, that often our customers can then just focus on three to 5% of their most critical vulnerabilities. So sometimes you might see more for the first time you see all your assets, but you realize you have less work because you're focused on those most critical three to 5% of vulnerabilities. So, and you're actually improving your security program by focusing on those most critical assets and vulnerabilities. So I just want to end, uh, and I'll turn it back to Steve for a second, but I want to end by talking about how you get started. Often I talk to customers who are at that bottom layer there of traditional vulnerability management. It's people powered, compliance driven. You're wondering, how do I move to the next level? And I encourage you, you know, you can work with Bytes and Tenable to this year, you know, start taking a more risk-based approach that's powered by machine learning and continuous assessment. And then ultimately you can use products like we have with Lumen that help you to really engage full cyber exposure management, which connects your security program to the business. So you're not just asking where are we exposed, but you're starting to really connect to the business by asking, are we reducing risk over time? 
Are we including analytics be, be beyond just basic vulnerability scores? And are we really measuring how our security program is improving over time? And that's a successful strategy uh, that you can work for towards in improving your approach to vulnerability management. Steve? Thanks, Adam. I think, um, I think that gives us a very good overview of, of <clears throat> vulnerability and vulnerability management and and kind of why it's important to actually look at where you know vulnerabilities come from and uh adam and i have have left some time in in uh in this uh webinar in order to to have a chat about some of these things and 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 look at actually how you can improve and and where you get the most bang for your buck the thing for me was though that <clears throat> There's always a link between vulnerability and 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 ultimately compromise because somebody, as Adam said, is always going to look at those vulnerabilities and look for the opportunity in order to do to exploit them and to provide you know a threat actor with the ability to be able to use that in order to compromise your systems. So at Bytes, we do a huge amount of of digital forensics, uh, incident management, and uh, threat intelligence, and um, one of the things that, that that we've looked at out of our our uh, uh, digital forensic research institute that we that we have that provides all of this information together is how common vulnerabilities lead to compromise and actually where are the points of intervention that you have the capability in order to actually be able to control before you get compromised. So there's multiple points of intervention, but let's let's look at the first piece. You know, the the mainstream um, areas where companies get compromised are those of phishing, some form of drive-by download, through a VPN, whether it be modern or legacy, and through a remote desktop that that that's exposed to the internet. Now, generally, what we tend to find is that there's different threats that that come along. You know weaponized office documents or browser extensions or some exposed creds that allow people in through a VPN where there isn't a multi-factor authentication, or there's a vulnerability in, in a, a, a Windows remote desktop that, that sat on the internet. And, uh, you know, hopefully all of you realize that, you know, if you want to know what remote desktops are available on the internet at the moment, go to Shodan, shodan.io. And uh, you can actually run a search and find all, all of the vulnerable uh, remote desktops in there. So if you've got one, uh, put your IP address in, have a look, see if you're listed and, uh, and whether it tells you whether you're exposed or not. Um, criminals are using this all day, every day. So, you know, use it as a, uh, as a defender to find out. So what are these guys actually after? Well, what they're after is they're actually after an internal device. They're looking for some form of internal device that they can get a foothold on. Now, the first opportunity that we have for intervention here is actually shoring up the outside of the network. So that's things like multi-factor authentication for users, hardening off of the services that we publish to the internet, making sure they're patched. You know, as Adam will tell you, and I'll probably ask him later about, you know, the number of vulnerabilities that they find where there's a missing patch. Uh, and, and also whether he knows how old those patches go back, because that's usually a good one, is you'll find a, a 2019 or a 2020 patch missing that's got a big hole in it that people use. But also things like protecting users against phishing, but also using things like internet proxies and, and, and control points to stop and break the chain between the user and the internet in order to be able to put a point of control within there. Now, generally what tends to happen is that they're trying to get onto this device internally and they're looking to expose any vulnerabilities that it's got that hopefully you will have found using the uh, Tenable uh, Vulnerability Management Service so you can close that down. Because what they're actually looking for is cached admin creds, right? You know, out of all the work that we've done, everything targets the, you know, pretty much the admin profile that's on that device for when it's set up or when it's managed. And they're hoping that either, you know, at worst, that's a local admin or at best, that's a domain admin because actually it saves a huge amount of time. So why do they go after these? Well, they want a foothold. The first thing to do is get a foothold within the environment so that you can maintain access and you can go on to compromise further. And I'll show you that in a moment. But we've got a secondary point here of, of intervention where actually 
you can protect these in de internal devices. So if you do get a weaponized Office document or a, uh, a browser extension that's loaded, if you're doing some very basic things like the attack surface reduction rules from Microsoft, hardening off the machine itself, you know, its uh, authentication and authorization processes, uh, removing some of the, the legacy SMB, SMB v1, using two-factor authentication for admin accounts, you know, that way, even if they take, you know, cached credentials that are on the device, actually they're no use to them because they either need an MFA soft token or a, you know, physical key in order to be able to use those credentials. Make sure they're patched and also restrict traffic out. And we'll come to why that's important in a minute. So where do you go next? <clears throat> well, once you've got foothold on that internal device, and it's it's not particularly difficult in order to, to get that foothold, you know, once you've installed a, a, a weaponized office document and uh, you've created a, a, a sub process or you've used um, uh, a browser extension that runs in the context of the browser and you've got a foothold and you can start looking at cache credentials. Generally, what they'll look to then do is scrape those creds out from, from the uh, uh, browser profile or from the, the local cache profile on the device. <clears throat> and then they'll put things like Cobalt Strike in in order to maintain persistence within the environment. The reason they do this is so that they don't have to stay on device. It means what they can do is they can fire in commands remotely into that device from the comfort of their own homes, and they don't have to worry about maintaining persistence or session because they can do it over, over what we call C2, which is command and control. Now, let's take the case that they weren't lucky enough to get a domain admin at this point. They were only lucky enough to get a local admin. So what they're going to need to do is they're going to need to move from that internal device onto an AD server. Everything goes back to AD. Why? Because you need a domain admin, right, to move around the server estate to actually get to where the, uh, the juicy data is that you store. So how do they look at doing these things? Well, what they'll do is they'll use products like Bloodhound or Sharphound. And what do those do? Well, what they do is they allow you to enumerate the AD. So all you need to be is a local admin on the machine. You can run these up. They'll tell you all the users, computers, everything else within the directory structure so that you can actually then identify an admin account. Where do you go next? PowerShell, injected DLLs or scheduled tasks that you're going to try and push remotely against the DC in order to execute your commands. What do you do then? Well, what you do then is you're going to use something like Mimikatz, Mimic, or Minidump uh, in order to try and actually expose domain admin creds. If you can't expose the domain admin creds by using these services, then generally what tends to happen is that they'll move to products like Impacket or SMB Exec, which allow you to then connect to the AD. They allow you to uh, mimic accounts and they allow you to compromise uh, cached creds on that device in order to then do replay attacks or pass the hash or fiddle with things like the golden ticket in terms of um, Kerberos so that you can then elevate your privilege to get into a domain admin. Now, clearly there's points of intervention here. You know, this is a late intervention. If they've, if they've got a foothold and they've got local admin on an internal device, then clearly, you know, you're at risk. Clearly, they're gonna try and move towards AD and you need to protect the AD in order to stop them being able to get domain admin creds or, or being able to authenticate around the environment. So again, it's similar things, you know, hardening, patching, admin MFA, all major things that will allow you to stop this movement, but also disabling services. You know, do you actually need a user's workstation to be able to run PowerShell? You know, do you need it to be able to run WMI or WMI persistence or actually call back to servers over those protocols? If not, disable them. EDR, absolutely, if you don't have EDR today, you're going to miss major opportunities in terms of intervention to be able to see PowerShell being used or, or remote command shell being used or the dropping of things like Mimikatz, Mimic or, or the use of Minidump. Monitor, 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 monitor. 
And actually, one of the interesting things is Sysmon. Sysmon used to be the uh, 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 Sys Internals product, and it was bought by Microsoft. It's now it's now free. You can download it, put it on there. Why? And you'll see in a minute why Sysmon becomes important. Sysmon becomes important because of the fact that servers don't actually show you movement of data in terms of SMB, and they don't show you name pipes, and they don't show you all the WMI connections either. If you put someone like Sysmon on, actually, you can find a lot of the mechanisms that, that attackers will use in terms of moving backwards and forwards. And they're going to use these things. Once they've got the main admin, they're then going to spread laterally across the environment from the DC towards a server that they want to compromise. Once they've got that server, and it's relatively easy with the domain admin, you know, use name pipes, you go across an SMB connection to the device, you can get to the data. Once you can get to the data, you then need to package it in order to get it out of the environment. Generally, what they'll do is they'll use BITS, which is a background intelligent, uh, intelligent transfer service, uh, or they'll zip up the data, or they'll use something like Win, WinSCP, or ProtoBuff is becoming quite popular because it allows you to stream data out. What they do is they package it up, targz's, raw files, or string packets. They generally hide the traffic in things like DNS port 53 or HTTPS port 443 and pop it out to cloud storage. Now, clearly, you know, that's a major issue because your data is now left. Okay. And it is almost too late at that point. But there's a point of intervention there in terms of restricting outbound traffic, using an internet proxy and monitoring allows you to capture, even if you haven't captured the rest of the stuff earlier within the attack cycle, actually you can still catch it at this point and stop it before it becomes too late. So that shows you how compromises occur and how you know simple vulnerabilities at the front end of this can lead to you know, major widespread compromise at the back end and you can lose data. Generally in this case, you know, this is a standard ransomware case. Clearly once they've exfiltrated your data, they're going to encrypt your, encrypt your servers and your availability goes away and it's very, very difficult to get it back. So what I'm going to move on to is, is a little bit of chat really for, for, for the last five minutes or so between, between Adam and I. So, so Adam, what, what common mistakes do people make at the front end of, of this? when it comes to vulnerability management? Sure, uh, great question, Steve. And I'll say that often I hear or, or see organizations that will scan infrequently. They don't use authentication during their scans. They just will dump raw findings onto uh, raw, raw vulnerability findings and scan reports onto the operations team. And it's kind of this simple process of analyze, prioritize, just report, and then, then they repeat it. And I will say that is not vulnerability management. That is just raw vulnerability assessment. And what I would really suggest is that a, a more risk-based true vulnerability management approach is much more. It starts with that, that basic assessment process, but it involves you know, what I talked about, which is validation, prioritization, understanding the context, knowing your environment, the assets, uh, having a deep understanding of the vulnerabilities uh, that might affect those assets, having a full process for patch remediation and management, uh, looking at software uh, security assessments from development through DevOps and into production, having a testing, retesting, and quality assurance process, and then having solid metrics, reporting metrics, uh, and analysis for all the levels of your organization. So you really want to be identifying where you're exposed, make sure that's driving remediation based on prioritization and truly measuring that you're reducing risk effectively. Uh, and obviously Tenable supports that with the tools that I talked about with ACR and VPR and also our Lumen product, which is really popular, which helps to measure uh, how you're reducing risk and allows you to drill down by business unit units and also produces a cyber exposure score. I think that's something really important for the business is quantifying your risk reduction, uh, not just using you know uh, heat matrices, but really quantifying that risk reduction and being able to benchmark, not just internally, but externally, uh, how you're doing against your peers. So in terms of this, 
you've made it sound really easy, Adam. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is a good thing in reality. So why don't more companies do this? Uh, you know, if you had asked me in my prior operational jobs, if I was taking a risk-based approach, I might have said yes. Uh, and, or I would have said yes, but I think I've learned, you know, really that that's not true in a lot of cases. And I'll give you two uh, quick examples uh, of, of things that I see in, in probably 80 to 90% of organizations I work with and something that I did personally uh, in, in a lot of companies that I worked at, uh, which is using something like a RAG score. This is that red, amber, green score. Uh, and it's something like this. You identify a generic risk, say access management, uh, and the beginning of the year, you label it red. Uh, halfway through the year, you've deployed some control, you label it amber or yellow. And at the end, end of the year, you say it's green, you fully uh, deploy the control uh, and you say you've controlled the risk. But this really fails. It really fails. It's not a true risk-based approach because when you think about it, uh, all you are measuring is that you've deployed a, a technical control. You haven't even confirmed whether you've identified the right risk. You haven't confirmed whether you've actually reduced that risk with that control. Uh, so often I think organizations confuse and think that this generic approach is risk-based uh, risk management when it's really not. Uh, and so, you know, true risk management begins with the process that I talked about, which is having that very deep, accurate understanding of your environment across every layer, cloud, traditional assets, OT, but then also prioritizing effectively with machine learning uh, and threat intelligence. You know, the other area I'll say really quickly that I sometimes hear about, I call the beat the bear fallacy. And this was actually described to me by a chief risk officer at a large bank in Europe who said, you know, I just, uh, it's like that old story of two, two runners in the forest uh, and they find out there's bears in the forest. So one of them puts on running shoes and the friend says, you can't outrun the bears. And the <laughs> other friend says, I don't need to outrun the bears. I just need to outrun you. But, you know, again, so this is organizations that say, I just want to be a little better than the company across the street. And yeah. while it's true that a hard target is good, you have to be appropriate to your risk. So if you're just building a generic program to be a little better than the company across the street, uh, that's not really an effective strategy. And I think what that leads to is, is, is out of control costs. You're just building generic capabilities. You really want to know uh, am I focused on the right risks? Am I addressing those risks effectively? Am I spending my time and resources in the right places? And the only way you do that is with effective, is with effective uh, vulnerability management and assessment and knowing your environment. Do you know, I think, I think you and I could sit here and talk about this all day, Adam, because, you know, I'd much prefer <clears throat> to see people control their risk upfront deal with vulnerability management before they end up in my forensics division, you know, looking at compromise. Well, thanks very much for joining us, everybody. We're out of time today. If you want to carry on this chat, you know, Adam, I and uh, other members of the Bytes and Tenable team are going to be available on our, our stand uh, within the expo area. Come have a chat to us. We'll happily uh, talk to you ad nauseum about, you know, vulnerability management, compromises and these kind of things. So thanks very much for listening. Please do drop by our stand, come talk to us. We'll talk to you more about these subjects. Thank you.